السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. On behalf of Qatar Debate Center, I would like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us in our last keynote session. This keynote session will be trying to answer the question, can debate be our ally in teaching the 21st century skill? Giving us this keynote will be Dr. Maya Nanovidic, who happens to have coached debate in over 40 countries. Her extended bio include a lot of relevant aspects to the today presentation, and that's why it will be incorporated in her presentation. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Maya. So just to make sure that we can all hear each other, I need to apologize for professional deformation, but I will be using a timer. So in case you see me sneaking up to see what time it is, this is what I'm doing, nothing else. Some people are still entering, so we want to give them some time as well. First, a show of hands that I would like to see how many of you are feeling slightly in disbelief to be at this conference. Did anybody have a sense of, whoa, what am I doing here? I have one person, two, three, four, five. Okay. I'll explain my sense of disbelief. There was a time not so long ago, probably some at this point a year and a half ago, where I wondered whether we are ever going to get a chance to meet again with colleagues, with friends in a different country, talking about topics that we all care about. Pandemic did a number on all of us, I think, where we all experienced this moment of dilemma and this moment of fear. And I would just like to share with you that I'm incredibly grateful and incredibly appreciative of the fact that we got a chance to meet here and to be here today. Now, um, I have a bit of a strange task today ahead of me. I'm going to talk to you about how I see debate as the tool to build 21st century skills. I'm being very intentional, not a tool, the tool. And I'll try to be as explicit as I can. But in order to do that, let me first try to elaborate a little bit on who I am. And this is my bizarre debate timeline. Now, why is this here on the screen? And why does it seem to appear to look like a heartbeat? Um, I, I think it's very relevant for the story I'm about to tell you. And I would like you to be aware of who I am and how debate has transformed my own life. I was born in Yugoslavia a country that no longer exists. It was a very happy childhood until it ended in war. I started high school in Hungary where I first saw, lived as a refugee and then later on acquired resident status. It was in Hungary where I was first introduced to the concept of debate. Now, as it happens for so many of us, and I'm very sorry to continue with the pandemic vocabulary, but it was in Hungary I picked up the debate virus. So at the point where I moved to the Netherlands to continue my studies, I was sorely disappointed to see that there was no debate club, no debate society at the university where I was studying at. So after several diplomas, several universities, at none of which had debate, <laughs> I was the one who was tasked with starting these debate societies wherever I went. Who gave me the task? Myself. Why? Out of pure selfish desire to continue being involved in debate. Back then I didn't really engage in that many self-awareness, self-critical reflections in terms of why do I like this activity so much. Uh, later on, I realized that there is a dark side to it, and I'll get into it in a moment. But suffice it to say that I am one of the people responsible for spreading debate around Europe in places where it didn't exist. Now, uh, also during my time, I ended up working in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in this country, as some of you may know, the war of the breakup of Yugoslavia left the biggest scars. I was living at the time in the city of Mostar. And this city to this day still has very deep scars and very deep divisions between the east side 
also known as the Muslim or the Bosniak side, and the West side, more colloquially referred to as the Croat side or the Catholic side. Now, it was in this city that I realized debate can do something different because I started one debate society when we were there. And together with students from both sides, we got together to talk. Looking back, I wonder maybe we could have played volleyball or played chess, I'm not sure. But I do believe it was the activity of debate and of talking about the problems in the society at the time that helps us connect. Many academics in the room, I think, are going to relate to the fact that at the point where I entered PhD, there's a flat line in my life because <laughs> I descended into a black, black hole. <laughs> this black hole involved me dealing with my topic, obviously, and not having very much time for anything else. However, the moment I re-emerged from the dungeon that was the PhD process, I immediately plunged back into debate. Uh, here you see a very short period when I was really coaching debate all over the place. And it was this debate when contextualized within so many different countries that I started realizing that with debate, we were barely scratching the surface of its potential. You see a path diverging after 2013, because it was in this room, I think it was this room, at a Qatar debate conference, that I effectively made a public pledge. Parallel to this development, one person in this room I need to thank, Steve, eternally indebted, also introduced me to the concept of dialogue. So I had a fellow debate coach introduce me to dialogue and to the book on dialogue by David Bohm, a theoretical physicist who decided to study human communication and how fragmented our identities and our thoughts are and how they contribute to conflict. And we come here to 2023 and there's a question mark. So I will ask you to help me answer that question mark. I have a tendency to use these public gatherings as people helping me figure out my life. I'm very sorry, you know, you're kind of uh, here co-opted into this task and we're gonna deal with this together. Now, obviously as a debater, or a former debater, I believe that debate can help us also make decisions and figure things out. So I'm gonna very briefly go through the pros and cons of debate. We've heard many of them reflected uh, in the last couple of days, so I'll do it very quickly. But I decided to use the medium of the British parliamentary debate. So let us just go very quick, quickly, and I'm drawing on Tony Wagner's book on the global achievement gap, which, curiously seems to resemble a lot the Qatar National Framework curriculum when it comes to the skills that we hope to be building in our students. Now, I believe that debate does every single one of these. I don't even need to give you absolutely any references because my colleague from Qatar Debate, Mr. Mohammed Abdul Rahman, in the previous session gave an excellent research, an excellent overview of the fact that we have it supported by data that debate does support every single one of these uh, skills and competencies developing. As you know, critical thinking and problem solving are some of the most elusive goals or learning outcomes of education today. Tony Wagner's book says that the problem with uh, this whole achievement gap is that the schools today are not preparing young people for the labor market. They're not even preparing them to deal with the complexities of the world that we live in. So in that sense, I find that in a, any given debate uh, society, even in any given debate competition, you're gonna find that your critical thinking is going to get developed you're gonna to have to adapt and think on your feet because questions are flying at you and in university format you have 15 minutes to figure your case out. You're gonna to have to collaborate across networks and you're also going to have to figure out leadership because if you're not a good leader, your teammate is not gonna be able to follow you. In the next debate, it will turn out that your teammate has more knowledge than you do, so you will need to be the one following them. There is a very, very intuitive and very a careful balance that we need to uh, keep in mind because debate does, in its own gamified uh, competitive framework, uh, develop. When it comes to initiative and entrepreneurship in Europe, uh, especially, debaters end up becoming 
fundraisers. They end up becoming, I can see smiles in the, in the front rows. They end up raising funds for their tournaments because these are not funded. Uh, they end up knocking on so many doors. So effectively, they also become lobbyists for debate activity. They become PR machines and they also become event managers. All of these things, I believe, indicate initiative and entrepreneurship. Effective oral and written communication, we don't need to go through this one. These are kind of self-standing. When it comes to accessing and analyzing information, some people are saying that debaters are better suited and more resilient to deal with yet another challenge of the world, which is, yes, <laughs> disinformation and fake news and the fact that we nowadays don't really know anymore what we're reading and whether it's true. Uh, accessing and analyzing information obviously is at the core of trying to figure out what, if what we're reading is true or not. Finally, curiosity and imagination. Um, in my long time of dealing with debate, I've seen debate topics reflect precisely this. I've seen an evolution in thinking, and I've seen an evolution in debate trying to push the boundaries in societies in which it operates. The funny thing with curiosity and, uh, and uh, imagination is that also if you do a boring speech, it's not going to exactly land you the winning position. So in that sense, you're also incentivized to figure it out and to make it more fun. So as the prime minister, I rest my case. Debate is brilliant. Don't you dare oppose me. But obviously... I'm supposed to come up with opposition. And here I really have to thank uh, Dr. Recep Shenturk because effectively he was the leader of opposition, not me. <laughs> His speech yesterday really covered a lot of the points uh, that you know we could argue against debate. So in that sense, he's saving me some time. So I will try not to echo some of his statements. I would just like to share with you that uh, in my research of why is debate negative, uh, I came up across an article that was published in 1937. And I bet many of you debate coaches here have no idea that the activity you've been spreading around is nothing short of evil, okay? But the best thing is that when you delve into the article, the, the article points out that debaters are accused of being tricky. They have strategies to beat people. They're very arrogant. And I love the most strongest argument of them all. For anybody who's not familiar with debate, if they have to go and sit in a room where there is a debate tournament happening, they're going to find this really bizarre interaction playing under very strange rules, and it's going to be incredibly boring for them. <laughs> so in that sense, yes, as you can see, debate is something that we need to, uh, that we need to be slightly careful about. Um, another quote that we have here is from a former debater who says that it was actually in debate that I first came across the concept of perversion and abuse of language. And that's okay. Let's own it. I will explain exactly why this is the case. But as the assistant leader of opposition, assistant to Dr. Recep Shenturk, I'd like to close with the words of Theodore Roosevelt, who says, to educate a person in mind and not in morals, is to educate a menace to society. Okay, getting tough, right? But as all the debate coaches know, when it comes to time for closing government, there is supposed to be a twist, right? There's supposed to be something different that I'm going to add to this debate now. So the thing that I would like to point out is that, yes, I'm going to concede to the opposition that ego is the problem. <coughs> However, ego is everywhere. Ego is not something that appears in debate, and ego is not something that is concentrated to debate. And uh, I need to do kind of a slight trigger warning for everybody right now. I'm about to be really negative about football. Okay, I understand this is a sensitive topic, so yes, I hope that you can bear with me, but uh, competition in football, as we can see, I mean, yes, it can do many wonderful things. I think it can promote our countries and make them well-known, etc., but in my country, football is primarily associated with nationalism. 
we cannot seem to have the ability to cheer for our own team without hating on somebody else. And uh, I believe that this is something that we need to acknowledge that ego is a part of a problem in general and not something concentrated to debate. In other words, you have to love English language. Don't throw the baby out with bath water just yet. <laughs> and I will now tell you, as closing government, why I believe that debate can be applied as a force for good in society. Now, since 2013, I've been working on a variety of projects that are using debate. They're not debate, but they are using debate. And let me tell you a little bit about them. Um, I would like to see a show of hands for those of you who come from countries where history as a topic is somehow controversial or contentious. Okay, very good. <laughs> so this is the region where I come from. As you can imagine, history is the topic that we cannot agree on. Uh, we are not agreeing on who started which particular conflict. There's a lot of kindergarten logic in terms of you started it, no, you started it, you started it. And it, uh, it permeates into textbooks, it permeates into the historical narratives, and it poisons us overall. This project called Historia Historia Poviest, it uses three words for history used in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the project was implemented in four countries. And why am I even talking about some random project? Because every single person working on implementing that project is a debater. And this is something that I believe is a blind spot that we're currently experiencing. Debaters are brilliant. I'm saying, let's use them. Let's apply them. In this project, as you can see, we did a lot of workshops in very many cities. Uh, we had a history exhibition that was seen by 70,000 people, and throughout every single aspect of the project, we were doing the exact same thing that debate does. We were asking difficult questions, we were creating space for people to discuss them, to reflect on them, and we were doing it with the one explicit purpose of trying to heal our societies. But history, for some reason, for the team that I was working with, wasn't enough. So we decided to take it up a notch and to try to make things a little bit more complicated. So for our next project, we decided to deal with a lighter topic, war crimes. In the Model International Criminal Court project, we have, and this project continues to this day, we have high school students from Bosnia and Herzegovina Croatia and Serbia joining mixed teams to operate as prosecution, defense judges, uh, defense lawyers, judges, and press. And what do they do? They put different war criminals on trial. As you can imagine, this is an incredibly complex topic. We've had situations where the children participating in the event, in the session, sharing a room was a girl who lost her family in Srebrenica, staying in the room with a girl whose father was a soldier on the Serbian side in Srebrenica. And these kind of topics, I believe, we would not have been able to address if I didn't have a team of debate coaches with me. Why? Because debate coaches and debaters were able to take this on. They knew that they would be able to provide enough support and space to discuss these difficult topics, regardless of what arose during a given session. Finally, I would like to share the most recent engagement that we are currently working in, also with a group of debaters. And we decided to go macro. So history, yes, war crimes, yes, these are all the topics that we can't seem to agree on and that we keep on fighting about but we realized that the problem that we see in society is polarization. So we decided to tackle it by coming up with a project that deals with depolarization. How is this project different from the other two? The animated videos, the Dare to Care interviews, as well as multiple other materials dealing with radicalization awareness, dealing with questioning European values, and at times contradictions in those European values, all of the materials were created by 
Yes, yes, you're, you're getting the, the, the kind of gist. They were created by debaters. Why? Because debaters are very good at breaking down complex topics into simple narratives, simple definitions that help open up a space for us to communicate. So at the end of the day, as the closing government, uh, we are faced with the burden of our choices that I need to remind you of. On one side, we have the choice of feeding our ego, seeking victory, beating others with our rhetoric. And on the other side, we have kindness, applying the 21st century skills to help ourselves and others navigate our polarized societies. And this concept of applied debate, when I try to explain it to others who are not debate coaches, just as I have so many of you here in the room, I renamed it. I call it Across Divides, because the project, as well as the approaches and the methodologies it applies are effectively the same. Now, finally, I'm not left with that much material for closing opposition, because again, Professor Recep really took out a lot of my material. It's really hard to be one of the last speakers in a conference, you know? Uh, because he talked about, you know, debate is not good when we do it in professional life, when we do it, you know, in marriage. So I like this mug that says, if I say, first of all, run away. I have prepared facts, data, charts, and I will destroy you. So let's face it, who wants to work with somebody like that? How many of you want to hire a candidate that exhibits those qualities? I can imagine not that many of you. Combative attitude like that, argumentative attitude like that in the workplace is not going to get us far. It's going to get us really bogged down into endless discussions. But best of all, one of the things that my leader of opposition stated, um, he said that we have a problem with divorce rates nowadays. And he said that if only we could all learn and know the rules of debate, everything would be fine. Well, guess what? I married a debater. <laughs> I know the rules. He knows the rules. And after countless sessions of marriage therapy, we are now fine. OK? <laughs> so I'm just kidding. But sometimes, even rules cannot help you, as you can see. So uh, this was my little kind of uh, excursion into using British parliamentary as a way for figuring out what is it that we're supposed to do with debate. However, I would like to remind you of one thing. The thing that I exhibited right now is the primary problem that we have in debate, which is it has a bad reputation because of equivocation. We are mixing things up. The problem is that when I say debate, and when I say I'm a debate coach, what I mean is that I'm a formalized, academic debate coach. When we attack debate and say it's too competitive, it's creating conflict, what we are effectively referring to is discussions and arguments that we see in the real world. Presidential debates in the US are not exactly giving the good name to the concept as well. And I think that presidential debates in the US are possibly the most public concept of having a debate that we are all familiar with. So in that sense, I would like us to be aware of the fact that we are having a little bit of a problem in terms of what is it that we're talking about. Because uh, the academic formalized debate, the kind of activity that we're all engaging in, I think that that is probably 0.1% of all of the debates worldwide. 99.9%, .9 I think, are the real life debates. And real life debates do not have rules and they do not have a third party, supposedly objective adjudicator. And I think this is where the problem comes. So in that sense, I think we need to be aware of that before we start chastising and punishing and saying the debate is really, really evil and problematic because we are using the exact same word for two very, very different concepts. Now, uh, 
Another thing that I think we need to be aware of is that, yes, we live in a complicated world in interesting times. And the problem with this type of uh, situation is that we require very much out-of-the-box problem uh, uh, solutions to problems. Now, like I said, I joined the group or the study or the school of dialogue a few years ago. What does that mean? That means that I'm now a member of the Academy of Professional Dialogue and I do a lot of different dialogic interventions and dialogue sessions. So imagine that in this group where dialogue practitioners are very good at getting to the bottom of things, being so filled with understanding and trying to understand who you are and where you're coming from. Imagine that in this group when I said that I'm a debate coach, you can imagine a little bit what the reaction was. The reaction was something along the lines of, <gasps> I almost felt like I said that I was doing something wrong. But at this point they accept me, it's fine. But uh, I think that we need to realize that uh, even in this group with dialogue practitioners, there is the problem that we do have a tendency to fall into the either or false dilemma trap. And this is a cognitive bias. This is something that we continuously suffer from. And this is a problem that we have a very hard time escaping. So I'll give you an example of another, exa uh, another false dilemma uh, situation. My sister, she's talking to a five-year-old child. She told me later on the story of how she felt incredibly stupid after that interaction. But anyway, she's talking to a five-year-old child and the five-year-old child asks her, so what's your favorite month in the year? And my sister is like, what, okay, well, October, I guess, you know, cause like she's born in October, so she just, picked a random month, and then my sister asks the kid, and what's yours? And the child says, I love all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the example of how our minds operate. We operate within the frames that we are given. And if we don't question the frames, we're in a lot of trouble. Now, I'd like to end this particular section of my talk on the concept of do no harm. Because I think do no harm is essential in absolutely every single field of work. I know that it's mostly uh, affiliated with the field of medicine, you know, with the Hippocratic Oath and everything, but I have a feeling we all need to apply this principle in our respective professions, whatever it is that we do. And here, I think we need to also remind ourselves of the fact that good debaters have good coaches. But I think that good coaches have brilliant mentors. And uh, I don't know if I was a good coach or not, but I did have a brilliant mentor who said that my agenda is to fight back the darkness by trying to bring the light of human reason. I want to replace weapons with words. I want every citizen to be a debater. I just quoted Professor Alfred Snyder. Yeah. And I can see that many of you also had him as a mentor. And it was really Professor Snyder who uh, in many ways encouraged me to think beyond the paradigms that we were given. So what is it that I would like you to do now? I realize that we have a problem with fragmentation. How many of you are known by different people in different contexts to be doing different things? We all have roles to play. Our, our identities are very much diverse. They're composed of so many different hats that we wear. And it was in this particular setting that I realized two days ago that some of the people who know me for 25 years and Boyana knows me for 25 years have no idea what I'm doing professionally. Because you see, the whole debate coaching the stories I showed you about the projects that I work on with debaters, that is volunteering. That is my work of the heart. But now, <laughs> but now I'll tell you a little bit about who I am because I realize that I haven't really properly introduced myself to many of you. So here comes the big reveal. Uh, I'm a meal specialist. You might assume that means I like food a lot, which would be a good assumption, but in fact, it means monitoring, evaluation, accountability, and learning. Uh, and this is something that I've been doing since my PhD because I actually am very passionate about the concept of impact, 
about determining whether what we do is in fact what we are hoping to do. And I find that this particular critical reflection on things is not happening often enough. So for those of you who are currently working on designing programs, on managing programs, implementing programs or projects, I'd like to offer some of my lessons of what are the key ingredients or the formula for achieving impact in your work. The first one is intentionality. I've evaluated many programs that you realize were being implemented because somebody said that they should be implemented or somebody saw somewhere that they were implemented and they thought it was a good idea. That's not good enough. Intentionality means that when you go into doing something, you have a very clear, explicit idea as to why you're doing it and what you're hoping to achieve. And this type of explicitness is something that really, really helps when it comes to impact. The second thing, and this is a big one for all of you who are wondering about debate formats and the competition. Form, in my experience, always has to follow function, not the other way around. Very often we have actually adopted certain formats for debate just because they were given to us. We haven't questioned to what extent they serve us, our context. So in that sense, I applaud Qatar debate and I applaud Munazara initiative and I applaud anybody who is trying to come up with a different format. Why? Because the more formats, the more ways of doing things that we have, the richer we all are as a community, as a collective. So in that sense, I would like us all to make sure that the function is the thing that drives the form. Uh, another thing that I also talked about is the critical self-reflection. So we need to have introspective. I think we need to be doing retrospective regularly on what we're doing and why we're doing it. But finally, I think we also need to do prospective. Uh, there is somebody here I talked to who is a historian uh, who is kind of doing future studies. And I love that because I think that we need to be continuously looking at where we were, where we are, and where we're going in order to be able to make a difference. Finally, part of the ingredients for impact in different projects and in different interventions are having your timing and sequencing down and fine-tuned particularly well. And this is something that is often a question of luck. I'll, I'll grant you that. You can't control for this uh, always. But at the same time, this is something that I think we don't think about enough. And then finally, what are the fields that I work in when it comes to these different evaluation and program design topics? I work in the fields of conflict transformation, fostering active citizenship and civic engagement, and working for social cohesion. So this is a little bit on who I am. And I have another four minutes, so my time management is going very well. But I'm not done yet. So I'll try to recap, and uh, please, in the Q&A, correct me if I'm getting things wrong from our conference and from our general time together. The way I see it, education is something that is supposed to offer people knowledge and skills to understand the world around us and to navigate the world around us. That's kind of my general understanding of what education is supposed to achieve. Yet, for some bizarre reason, the core skill required to exist in society alongside other people, and this core skill is communication, for some bizarre reason, this skill is never being taught. Let me use a very bad analogy of driving. Imagine you gave everybody a car, you didn't take them to a driving school, and there were all of a sudden all of these accidents and people were crashing into each other. And then your conclusion is, what are they doing? It seems to me that with communication, we are operating on a very, very wrong assumption. We seem to be operating on the assumption that communication is something that comes naturally. That just because we can speak, just because we can string 
words into sentences that are grammatically correct, that this means that we are able to communicate. But I think that if we look at the state of the world today, the levels of polarization, the existence of conflict, are at the core inability to resolve any of the common problems we have. I think it's time to abandon the assumption that we can communicate. And I think it's time for us to find a way to teach this skill. And here comes debate. And I think this is where it's very much chronically misunderstood. Debate is one of the few places, one of the few ways where we teach communication, where we teach argumentation, where we teach persuasion, and where we teach critical thinking. However, we need debate, but the way that we've been doing it is barely scratching the surface. Again, competition, in my experience of a debate coach, is barely 10% of my interaction with my students. Competition is maybe the most public thing that you see if you're a parent or if you're a sponsor, if you're one of the VIPs who comes to the event. So you see a little bit of a fragment of competition, which is very, you know, high energy and a lot of kind of, uh, you know, boisterous young people who like to fight uh, with words, but that is barely 10% of what debate is. And I find it incredibly worrisome that debate is the only thing that I know that teaches communication in our educational system, and at least in Europe, I can only speak for Europe. It is not part of the curriculum. It is in no way accessible and available to everybody. We end up working with a fragment of the whole student population. And I think that continuously we feel like we're not doing enough. So I'm going to leave you with three things to think about, or three invitations, if that's okay. My first invitation is, I would like us to be critically intentional about our impact as people who are together working in the field of communication. Yes, debate builds skills. We're all certain of it, we've seen it, we know that this is the case. However, what are those skills being used for? Some of us have seen students who have gone on to take on jobs and positions that are not exactly serving public good. And I would like us to become critically intentional about giving students skills, but also asking students to apply those skills for public good. I would like all of us here to implement more applied debate programs because when we connect them with things like nonviolent communication, with Bohmian dialogue, when we connect them with things like positive youth development, all of these programs have a definite potential for spreading communication skills to a wider segment of society who might not end up engaging in debate, but they will have their communication improved. Another thing uh, when it comes to this particular request of mine about being intentional about our impact, I would like us to stop saying that young people need critical thinking. The world would not be in the state that it is in if adults had critical thinking figured out. Okay, so in that sense, I would like our applied debate programs to also have the uh, dimension of intergenerational interaction. I would like to bring people together of different ages who can talk together about different topics. Why? Because I really believe that fragmentation is a problem. Us dividing into different groups on age, on gender, on profession, on academic discipline, etc. None of that really is helping us. The second thing that I would like to propose to the debate community and everybody here in the room I would like us to be a little bit more intentional and a little bit more, uh, I guess brave is the word I'm looking for, in decolonizing our mind and our language. Why am I asking for us to do this? Because language at the end of the day is power. 
a language is control. I was quite surprised at this conference to hear that several people were referring to Arab Spring. I have a very big problem with this term, you know, and I have a problem with the term when it's being used by, sorry to say, but Arabs themselves. Uh, it is a term that is very, very much, I believe, a colonial term. And this is just one simple example of how I believe we need to start examining the language that we're using. Because if we don't examine it, the language itself is always going to be a thing that prevents us from understanding each other, rather than helps us to understand each other. And finally, uh, the third thing, my third request is, I heard yesterday something that apparently is a very Gen Z thing, I uh, think I have Ana Maria to thank for that, <laughs> that your vibe attracts your tribe. And I'd like us all to acknowledge for the Qatar debate that you have a pretty damn good vibe <laughs> because the tribe that you have gathered in this room <laughs> is an incredibly diverse, but at the same time, incredibly inspiring tribe. Uh, in the past two days, and it feels like I've been here a month, but in the past two days I've had conversations on radicalization, on polarization. I've had a discussion on sociology of values. I've talked about resilience as well as learned helplessness. And with every single one of these conversations, I've found myself running off to some corner and then furiously scribbling and catching notes, trying not to forget the inspiration that I felt and the thoughts that emerged as I was talking to so many, so many of you here in the room. So in that sense, uh, I see us all as very much a community of practice. Uh, I know that we're different. I know that some of you are Islamic scholars. I know some of you are argumentation scholars. Some of us are debate coaches. Some of you are dialogue practitioners. Political scientists here in the room, <laughs> I know that there is more of us, but we are different. We come from different places, but we are a community of practice because the thing that I see as uniting all of us is the fact that every one of the persons in the room that I talked with, and I'm sure those of you that I didn't get a chance to talk with, are here to advance communication and understanding among different groups in society. So in that sense, uh, I would like to thank you because the examples that I've seen all of you give and Qatar Debate is really the organization that I think serves that example quite uh, beautifully. I've seen you all embody the example of what it means to constitute servant leadership. Because servant leadership is something that I think we need. Thank you. Do I need this? Thank you, Dr. Maya. As a previous debater and a debate instructor of nine years, I definitely agree with everything that you've said. Uh, 10 years ago, you gave a keynote in the same building, probably the same room, uh, and I was a debater then, and 10 years later, you gave us another keynote. And I think uh, your experience will be very relevant, and that's why I'll, I'll, hit, uh, I'll ask one question, I'll open the floor for students. But my question will be as a meal specialist, right, monitoring and evaluation. <laughs> Uh, and, and this is because we've heard in this conference and the panels multiple ways of assessing, debating, critical thinking, and teaching architecture, and many other things. Uh, but you, I think, suggested that maybe critical thinking is not the main parameter, and you gave us examples of using uh, debaters in uh, solving polit uh, historical issues and also war crimes. So my question is simply is, what, should, what do you think the metrics that we should you know, evaluate debates upon? and how that can be done, because a lot of us, you know, debate instructors and others might benefit from that. Okay, thank you. So, again, I'm not your standard monitoring and evaluation person, because I would say that you're going to design your program according to what you want to accomplish. Currently, a lot of the, the monitoring and evaluation that I see is mostly measuring outputs. We've had this many people in the room attending this particular activity, so we look at numbers. Another thing that we look at maybe is a pre-post and post-event uh, questionnaires in terms of what did you know about this before and what do you know now. Uh, I believe that what we need is to plug in the element of intention and to plug in the element of application. How do you intend to use those skills? Uh, and I think this is something that obviously in a debate uh, organization you can find a way where you already, through the 
topic selection of your motions where you already kind of try to nudge students into a certain direction? Open the floor for questions. Uh, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Maya. Uh, uh, coming to Qatar, I feel uh, so, uh, as in speaking English, so minimalized because I love how we Arabs say in greeting, uh, how we say thank you and, 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 and so on. So I'm going to try in English that I'm going to say, I'm going to ask my question with gratitude uh, because, uh, and, and thank you for sharing um, your presentation with us and your, and your, your history and, and allowing us to be part of your uh, therapy. Um, so a, a comment or two and then the question. Um, the comment is your HIP project from 2014, Historia, Historia and Provigias, HIP. Is it by accident that's also a high impact practice? And is, if, is that why you chose the title? So does, uh, from, from that I get to the, in leading up to servant leadership, uh, we think, uh, you know, coming from argumentation studies, we, we have a bit of a discussion, debate, deliberation, those D words, uh, about whether or not we should be teaching critical thinking or teaching for critical thinking. And do you think, uh, so does debate help create a brave space rather than a safe space? Because if we're spending our time creating safe spaces, we might not have these crucial conversations that you're pointing to. So in, in creating a brave space through debate, um, which requires intentionality, is that a way of building character uh, uh, the, where I disagree with you is that I don't think as a, as a teacher that my job is to measure impact because I can't, and, and all, your, all your ingredients of impact are actually non-measurable. The, the, the teachers who've had the greatest impact on me aren't the teachers who knew the Pythagorean theorem the best, but the teachers who showed character. So do you think Debate does that, and how is it that we can measure intentionality in the process of teaching debate? I, I don't know if that question is clear, but yeah. I, I hope it's enough. Yeah, okay. So in terms of the high impact practice, I must admit I've never heard of the concept. We were just playing around with words and we used the three different words for history and we were super proud of ourselves that the acronym was HIP. So this is the, the level of depth that we applied to the project. <laughs> uh, but So yeah, the, the high impact practice is completely accidental. Uh, in terms of the question that you ask about uh, evaluating, intentionality is not something that I can ever determine uh, prior to the project. It is something that I can observe, having evaluated so many different projects in many different topics, that in the end separates the really successful ones from the ones that didn't quite meet their benchmarks and their targets and their goals. And it's the level of intricacy of the uh, designing team, the implementing team, to the extent to which they think about everything. You know, and I'll give you an example, a very silly example, but Qatar debate was very, very intentional about making sure that we all get here on time. We all had a 6 a.m. wake-up call, right, in our rooms. And I know that this is a silly example, but this is an example of very much intentionality and design element where you try not to leave things to chance. So intentionality can be measured because you look back to the project design. And uh, I don't expect you as a teacher to uh, measure your impact. This is something that I think if you're lucky, your own students are going to get in touch with you probably usually 10, 15, 20 years later and tell you themselves how they see the role that you played in their life. Uh, for those of us who are mostly uh, you know, engaged in shorter term projects, project-based mentality, you know, because the funding is organized that way, uh, we do need to figure out uh, how to measure our projects and how to learn from them because in a year time we're going to be implementing another one. And we need to know that we have learned 
from some of the lessons from the previous one in order to make the next one better. Another, another question? Uh, سؤالي uh, ليس متعلق بالمناظرات بشكل مباشر لكن uh, uh, سؤالي ليس متعلقا بالمناظرات بشكل مباشر لكن هو uh, فكرة uh, لفتتني بحكم اهتمامي بالإعلام والسياسة uh, انتقاد مصطلح الربيع العربي uh, حبذا لو uh, تفصلي لنا ما هو وجه الانتقاد فيه لماذا اعتبرت أن مصطلح الربيع العربي غير مناسب أنا مهتم أسمع منك بشيء من التفصيل شكرا Okay, so just very briefly because I'm not uh, yeah this is not my area of expertise but the moment something is referred to as spring to me personally it refers back to the national awakenings in 1848 Europe where we were all trying to uh, come into our nationhood. I perceive Arab countries as having that prior to the Arab Spring. So in that sense, I don't perceive that as being the, you know, the birth moment of your nations. In Europe, when we refer to Spring, the Croatian Spring, the Hungarian Spring, the Austrian Spring, we're referring to the moment of the birth moment of nations. And I felt that, uh, I feel that referring to the events that happened uh, from you know, from that period uh, in Tunisia and in other places, Egypt, I felt that they have a very Western paradigm of interpreting it because the West was expecting this to result in democracy. You know, and democratization, the process of becoming democracy, the process of transition, to me, that's again a very Western concept. Democracy as a system is a very Western concept. I'm not saying it cannot exist anywhere else. What I'm saying is that we need to be very intentional in how we use different terms. I'm very much in favor of human rights as a concept. I don't like it when human rights are used as a weapon of critiquing and controlling and looking down on other countries. And this is what we continuously do. And uh, for me, I believe that Arab Spring simply as a concept, because it was coined in the West, it simply comes with like a big bag of expectations and conceptual frameworks and terminology that I simply feel we should try not to internalize. And I'll give you the most basic example from my own region, okay? Uh, because I come from the region that would be qualified in Europe as the Balkans. And the Balkans don't have the best uh, reputation in Europe. We're known as the gunpowder keg of Europe, right? We're we're that uh, peaceful, fun-loving citizens uh, of the corner of Europe. And the problem is that uh, how knowledge reproduces itself. I studied at a Western university. My PhD was at the University of Amsterdam. I was studying the Balkans. I was supposed to write about the process of transition from post-conflict to peace, from communism to democracy, from centrally planned to capitalist uh, economies. At my Western University, I was not just not encouraged, I was explicitly suggested that if I use any other literature than Western literature to recognize and to describe my continent and my part of the European corner, that this is not going to be accepted. And guess how Balkans is described? Here we have a Slovenian tribe sitting in the front row. There is the Serbian tribes that we should all be really afraid of because you know what Serbs are like, right? I'm not going to even start about Bosnians. So in that sense, when you're forced to use Western literature to talk about your own self, the only thing that you can internalize is a sense of inferiority. And this is what I mean by we need to decolonize our minds and our language. Uh, thank you. We'll take the two questions from here together and then one in the middle. No problem. Yes. Yeah. Both of you, yeah. You? No. Together. <laughs> in any order, yes. Uh, um, I have a question about uh, non-rule debate. To, to teach debate to a certain degree is a process 
It's, a, it's the very process of formalization and to internalize uh, some uh, specific laws within a specific society. So do you see a kind of tension between uh, whether debate is teachable or not and you know, the kind of best debate, as you mentioned in your talk, that you know, real life debate has no rules. Do you see that kind of tension? So, for example, currently in my country, China, there are a lot of artificial debate. For example, a national debate about whether humanity is good or bad, or whether we should play down English education in China. So, I'm, so my, my question is, do you see the tension between the teachability of debate and the best kind of debate as you have envisaged in your talk? Thank you. Uh, your question is like a whole separate conference we could go into. I don't, I don't have like, I'll, I just have my opinion which is at best a very unthought, undigested hypothesis. I feel that debate is in many situations uh, caused or informed or conditioned by its origins. And what do I mean by that? In the part of Europe that I come from, debate did come from the West. It came from a group of American debate coaches who were effectively flown into our part of Europe to teach the American debate format. So this is the origins of debate in our part of the world. I think we need to know the origins in order to know how it developed. And I do believe, and this is why I applaud uh, all of the initiatives that are trying to localize and come up with own, uh, own formats and own culturally uh, sensitive and culturally specific types of formats because I don't know, Boyan, you can correct me, but I sometimes find that Croatian debaters, they don't even have the vocabulary in Croatian to talk about some debate terms. We literally resort to English, right? And this automatically, what does it do? It makes us as debaters separate from society. We're the, exo the exotic group who can like talk really fast and who can do these arguments, etc. But effectively, the thing that we are doing is we're, you know, we're our crowd and our tribe is you guys. It's abroad. We kind of slightly uh, separate ourselves from our own society. So in that sense, I believe that uh, debate, the good quality debates, I think that we need to figure out what they are in every single society when it comes to practicing communication. And for international uh, tournaments, I think that we need to be much more mindful and much more intentional about controlling for bias. The reason why in international tournaments we are still very much focusing on the Western model or whatever it means is because really when you look at it, the, the, the coaches, etc., the trainers, the adjudicators, many of them are mostly going to come from the West. So in that sense, I think that one day when we have a Chinese debate model, when we have the Arabic debate model, when we have the, I don't know, French, whatever, I'm just like uh, coming up with different examples, but then imagine having multiple models together and the only rules you have is you have seven minutes. You know, and then let's see what comes out from that particular room. And I think that this is the beauty of these attempts of multiplication that I see right now. I love the fact that we are going in the direction of having more debate formats that are more culturally specific. What's there not to love? سؤال باللغة العربية وأنت تتحدثين أو أنت تقومين بعرض مسيرتك سوري وأنت تتحدثين أو تقومين بعرض مسيرتك في المناظرات تحدثت عن الكثير من التحديات خاصة التأقلم مع البيئة التي كانت البداية فيها لا يوجد كثير من المناظرات أو حتى مصطلح المناظرة لم يكن محترف أو مبرر بهذه الطريقة سؤال سائل مصر الجانب العاطفي من مسيرتك بصفتك مدربة أو متناظرة محترفة هل أثر هذا في نوعية علاقاتك خاصة عندما تحدثت عن التواصل اليوم نحن مثلا 
قد نريد التواصل مع الأشخاص فيقولون لنا أنتم متناظرون مثلا لا نستطيع إقناعكم أو أنتم متناظرون دائما تتحدثون بلغة صعبة أنتم دائما يعني تأتون مع الكثير من المعلومات وكذا فكيف أثر هذا على المزلك العاطفي في اختيار علاقاتك وهل أبعدك من المجتمع أو جعلك تقتصرين فقط على نوعية معينة من الأشخاص؟ Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm laughing because you know you no could problem. you could argue that a woman debater can only marry a male debater, right? This is what right. I'm I, mean, I can see that you're going in that. Right? <laughs> no, uh, I I think that it's it's part of a it's part of a self reflection or the critical self reflection that we need to know is that when we are not inside the debating tournament, we should make sure that we're not applying the dark power that we have and using it onto other people. I think we need to listen more in order to understand where they're coming from. Why? Because if we don't, we will effectively block them from expressing themselves. So in that sense, uh, for me, when it comes to this, debate becomes very much secondary, if not third, to the first cardinal rule of public speaking, which is know your audience. You always need to adapt to your audience. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, uh, you've coached debate in 40 countries, uh, and, uh, and from the debate that you've seen, some people have a very different idea about who are the debaters and what are the other debaters. Of course, these perceptions came from some debaters who are slightly different than the debaters that we'd like to make, right? So, uh, do you have any comments on how uh, debate coaches, and I'm sure you, you've had different experiences with different coaches, and I still remember your workshop, I think it was 216, where I remember keywords like empathy, like, you know, like paradigm shift, you know, uh, where, where you told us about the otherness that can lead all the way to genocide, right? So you had a very different approach than the others that I've seen. So do you have any thoughts on how can debate instructor do it differently? I, I know you addressed it in the, in the comments, but do you have any comments on that? Uh, every single debate instructor comes with their own life story and their life experience. And I think that more often than not, this is another part of the fragmentation. I didn't share anything about my life and my background with my students probably for the first 15 years of my teaching experience. Why? Because I didn't think it was relevant. That was one. Second thing, I didn't necessarily want to share my vulnerabilities. You know, why should somebody know that I was a refugee when I was 10 years old? How is that relevant for the authority and the expertise that I have right now? But it is relevant because it informs who you are. And every single one of us uh, who has a hard time with answering the question, where are you from? You have a story. And I think that you need to share this story. Why? Because by showing it to your students, by showing that you are able to embody who you are in all of your complexity, the thing that you teach your students is how to do the same for themselves. Because this is a, get another thing that nobody teaches us. But I do believe that as debate coaches, we do sometimes underestimate the extent of the role modeling that we do. We teach by who we are, not always by what we do and how we do it. So in that sense, I just want the debate coaches to be more mindful of, uh, of their role modeling function. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a great talk. And of course, after every very good meal, you, you need some time to digest, and it's very difficult to digest this beautiful talk, and I need some time, but still, it will be a personal question, since it was a personal, let's say, kind of presentation. Um, we've been discussing uh, about the aim of the debate. Uh, it's the lots of speakers said it's, it cultivates analytical thinking, even language abilities, you know, lots of things, or at the same time, it's the resolu resolution of difference of opinion, it's the decision making, finding truth, or maintaining relationships. Um, so, after all this experience with debate, what's your takeaway? How do you answer this kind of question? Thank you for the question. I did think about it a lot, and I guess my answer is going to maybe be a little bit strange. But it's not what it is, it's what it does. And what it does is develop all those skills that I mentioned. It builds self-confidence and it helps you self-reflect and understand your own position and your own agency in the world. The outcome of debate 
the format that we do, it never is about resolving problems, etc. But it is about listening to yourself as you're going through arguments, either defending a topic or going against it, to trying to realize how do I feel about this particular issue? What is my actual opinion? The problem in the society is that most of us don't necessarily have opinions, but we're defending ideas and clinging on to them for dear life as though our life depends on it. So for me, debate, it's not what it is, it's what it does. What it does to you is that it helps you come into your own as a fully baked human being. I think we don't use our brains in such a way that they actually work for us. And I think that debate and debate activities and mindful, intentional debate coaches can maybe help you figure out how to also not let your brain and your mind play tricks on you we fall prey to cognitive biases, to confirmation biases, to logical fallacies all the time. I'm supposedly a debate coach and I supposedly teach these topics. I catch myself in these errors approximately every 20 minutes, if not more often. Life is a game of cat and mouse with your own brain. And I think that debate is something that has a small chance of helping you play that game in such a way that your brain doesn't end up getting the upper hand. Our minds are conditioned by the society we live in. And for me, debate is a chance, it's a potential for freedom from that conditioning. And, uh, thank you, Dr. Maya. I'm for still all around, we can still talk. She's still around, you can still ask her question. Thank you, everyone.